Unit 3. Variables that affect teaching learning chemistry. Unit Introduction. One of the challenging tasks of teaching is choosing of an appropriate teaching method for a given lesson. Having knowledge of the variety of active learning and traditional methods is halfway to the effective utilization of the methods. There are a number of factors that a teacher should consider in deciding about the right teaching method in each time he or she teaches. An arbitrary way of selecting a teaching method often leads to failure. Instead of only talking about the general principles and theories of teaching and learning alternatives, it is very good and supportive for teachers to communicate when and where they are going to use methods X, Y, etc. than methods M, N, etc. This is because the knowledge, skill that immediately serves a practitioner to start with. Therefore, this unit of the module is going to make clear what dimensions should be incorporated and in mind when the teacher decides certain instructional alternatives for certain lessons and students. Learning outcomes upon completion of the unit the you will be able to explain why they select some over other methods in teaching chemistry. Describe the factors that affect teaching and learning chemistry. Discern the possible problems of methods used in teaching chemistry. Find out the difficulties of student to understand high school chemistry and operate on their problem. Develop skills of contextualizing methods to teach chemistry contents across grade levels. Mention their basis for their selection and decision on methods to be used for teaching different chapters of high school chemistry. Section 1. Categories of factors affecting teaching slash learning chemistry. Activity 3.1. Identify and discuss the most critical variables that affect the teaching learning processes of chemistry. Discuss for seven minutes with your immediate seat meet and reflect to the whole class. In any teaching learning processes, the nature of the content, the nature of students and availability of resources are the determinant factors either to facilitate or hinder the teaching learning processes. 1. The nature of the content. Of the others the nature and the kinds of arrangements of contents are the basic and critical factors in teaching, because the very purpose of teaching is attempting to make relatively perfect synergy between the content and students. Therefore, thinking about the planning of the contents, Learning experiences and assessment techniques ahead and critically is very important. Before we go to in deep to the discussions about the nature of contents in chemistry, let's brief something about the objectives of the lesson. This is because the contents are normally driven from lesson objectives. Don't forget that contents are vehicles or tools to realize the objectives. The objective of the lesson. The objectives of a lesson highly influence how you have to teach the lesson, because different educational objectives require different ways of communication. Two things are supposed to be found out about objectives to decide which methods are appropriate for them kinds of objectives and levels of objectives. In terms of their kind teachers should find out if their lessons are addressing the cognitive domain, the psychomotor domain, and or the affective domain. In terms of the level of the objectives, Teachers should know which of the subdivisions of each kind of the objectives are being addressed by their lesson. For example, 
If it is the cognitive kind of the objective, they have to find out whether it is of the lower cognitive such as knowledge, comprehension, application or it is of the higher level such as analysis, synthesis, evolution. Once they do this, they can move to think and decide on which method is appropriate to learn and teach them. The three ingredients of chemistry contents. In text question 3.1. What are the three thought levels in chemistry contents? Chemistry, like the other science disciplines, operates at three thought levels the macro, the micro and the symbolic. The macro refers to the phenomenological, what can be perceived by the senses without the aid of instruments. This is usually concrete. The micro refers to that which can only be perceived with the aid of instruments, or that which is abstracted by inference from chemical processes. This is often abstract. The symbolic refers to symbols, models and equations and these are often representational. The micro and the symbolic interpret the macro, these interact and have to be manipulated skillfully for understanding to take place. The novice learner has great difficulty in working at all three levels at the same time, almost certainly because of information overload. As a result, chemistry teachers need to be well systematic in order to make their content not very solid to avoid the students' hopelessness in their learning, and not very easy, simple to avoid students' carelessness in their learning. Therefore, it might take the lesson easy, if the teacher always start, and treat from concrete to symbolic, and then to abstract. Based on the nature of the content, sometimes, it needs to treat lessons from their abstract, symbolic and concrete, concrete, abstract and symbolic, or from symbolic to the concrete, and then to abstract. Examples the teacher may explain that acid plus base gives salt plus water first abstract. Second, he or she will symbolize the idea of RHCl plus noun RCl plus H2O symbolic. Third, the class is going to see the processes of the reactions in the laboratory by combining the actual HCl with the actual noun concentrated. One can also move the other way round, or it is possible to start from the symbolic then to the others. Please try to develop more teaching learning chains that flows from abstract, symbolic and then concrete and vice versa. Language and Structure of Chemistry The language of chemistry is another important aspect of chemistry contents. This can be considered from different perspectives. The subject chemistry is very unique in utilizing its own language through the atomic symbols designated by different chemists at different times. The other perspective is its discursive characteristics. That is social discourses are characterized by being personal, theory constitutive, anthropomorphic, speculative, and animistic. Whereas the language of chemistry is often impersonal, descriptive, transitive, objective and labeling. Again, everyday language often assumes an operational meaning in chemistry. In order words, the technical language of chemistry is actually composed of words that have common sense conceptions. This interaction leads to confusion and influences performance of the students. It is important to build chemical language in line with social discourse. Chemistry language has high information density. 
This implies that the language is often of the content type. It is claimed that, while everyday discourses have about 2-3 content words per clause, chemistry often has BETWEN 10-13. We have also noted, that the micro level, where chemistry is often focused, involves processes of abstraction. This has an effect on the language of chemistry. The process of abstraction is achieved by nominalization of actions and events, and this often obscures meaning and introduces ambiguities. The fact that the process of abstraction is inherent in chemistry indicates that there is structure in its semantic representation. This implies there are basic levels of abstraction, and therefore there are basic concepts. The presence of semantic categories is an issue of great importance in the chemistry curriculum. This hitherto has not been given adequate attention. For example, school students and maybe some university students do not understand phenomena from a particle view. The particulate view contradicts students' intuitive and everyday view of matter as continuous. The concepts of chemical reactions, chemical bonds, conservation and structure of matter should be understood by students before they go on to other concepts. There are specific problems associated with the use of normal English words in a specialized sense in chemistry. Finally, chemistry boasts numerous models for each concept. Again this should be considered in any task arrangements and delivery. The models should be scrutinized with great care, because most derive from the perception of single, or few authors of textbooks, and do not necessarily represent export conceptions. Again, the presence of different models explaining one concept leads to confusion both on the part of the teachers and students. Hence the treatments of different languages, chemical symbols, models, chemical reactions, etc. need care in presentation as well as students' task preparation. When we, as teachers, make things in the lesson complex and demanding should be with intention and within the control of the facilitator slash the teacher, and of course after some mental thought investments should be controlled by students. But if things are very much complex with no intention, it is very difficult sometimes, even to manage in getting the truck for the classroom members including the teacher. Basic, fundamental, facts and truths in the field, for example, chemical symbols, basic principles and safeties of chemical reactions etc. should be treated very well, and then arranging tasks for students further rigorous engagements. Otherwise, chemistry contents affect the teaching learning negatively. Assignment 3.2 Explain the role of atomic symbol language in chemistry teaching learning by comparing the role of numbers in mathematics teaching and learning and try to discuss the contributions negative or positive of symbolic language in chemistry teaching and learning. Alternative Conceptions in Chemistry In text question 3.2 Are salt and water chemicals? Why? I am sure many of the students in grade 9 for example may say salt and water are not chemicals. This is a misconception from their home environment. People consider chemicals are something which are factory products, and only proper for chemistry or laboratory. So the teacher has to take care about such alternative conceptions, in order to utilize them for the success of the instruction, 
by making the confusion from student environment clear. Research is unequivocal about the presence of alternative conceptions in chemistry. Students have developed these conceptions as a result of their interaction with physical substances in nature. Many of the alternative conceptions are related to students' understanding of the chemical substance, particle kinetics and chemical change. Research has revealed that these alternative conceptions are resistant to change, but those they nonetheless can be changed over a long period of time. For chemistry, however, it has already been noted that misconceptions relating to chemistry knowledge and its explanation is found frequently. The best way to handle alternative conceptions or misconceptions is to create cognitive conflict by questioning how much the conceptions are real conceptions and the misconceptions are misconceptions or through the use of ANOMALUS9 unusual data. Teachers need to check what conceptions students bring to their chemistry learning and to set up opportunities for these to be discussed and challenged as necessary. It has to be recognized that this is a time-consuming process. It will depend on questioning, discussion, group work and time allowed for learners to play with ideas. In the long run, this time will be well spent, but it does demand a content reduction. Two, the nature of students. In text question 3.3. Mention the most important components of a classroom. Dear students, the content and the teacher are the key components of the teaching learning processes. In other words, teaching and learning, though in low quality and efficiency, can occur without the administrators, the principals the classroom, the chair, etc. but not without the students, teachers and the contents. Actually learning might appear, without the teacher, only with the synergy of students and contents. In any way, students are always at the center of any instructional process. All the other inputs in the education system have worked for better students' learning. A teacher therefore should always consider their needs, abilities, learning styles, prerequisite knowledge, etc. in making decisions about teaching methods. The nature of students can be seen from the dimensions of different variables class size, ability, motivation, and participation levels. Class size the number of students assigned in a class is one critical factor in determining the type of teaching method to be used in that class. At one extreme a group may consist of only one student. In such circumstances you could use methods like project method or assignments tutoring and individually prescribed instruction such as open learning method. All these methods will not be part of your choice when you have lessons delivered through small groups between 5 and 20. With such in a group you may choose discussion method or any other suitable. In small class size, the teacher can use various methods as flexible as however, he or she expects to produce generous and versatile experiences, and then to provoke more experiences from that limited number of students 1 to 20, 25, 30, 35 or 40 which depends on the overall background of nations. This is recommended in order to fill the gaps that present due to the small number of students. In large class size one of the best advantages is that the heterogeneous nature of experiences that come out from the class 
When the group size is as large as 50 or above, you may have to use methods such as lecture or demonstration or other appropriate strategies. Here the teacher is expected to address himself and his methodology to every child in the class wisely and properly. That is to mean teachers may use different strategies such as creating sums within the large class, well thought materials arrangements, seating arrangements that allow movement in the class and make contact with each child in the class as far as the teacher as well as the students want to do that. Chemistry by its nature is more practice oriented subject if you look the dictionary meanings of laboratory, it says laboratory is a place for practical comma experimental activities particularly for the subject chemistry. Though large class size is a problem in the overall teaching learning processes, its problem is more serious in subjects with high practical contents than theoretical contents because practice-oriented contents need a serious follow-up of students by the teachers and the other way. We chemistry teachers therefore need to make subgroups within the class, and make ourselves available in each group within a given time intervals. And when there are topics or contents which can be delivered through dictation it is possible comma better to back the whole group. To sum up what is explained above, in addition to the utilizations of the techniques to handle large class size, in large class size dictation and demonstration become more obligatory than innovative and self-engagement learning. Students' ability refers the cognitive, psychomotor and emotional talents of the learner. To classify students' inability, we normally classify them by using their academic achievement as a standard. The assumption behind is the academics incorporate the aforementioned three domains. In a general saying, high able group comma class is better fit to active and innovative teaching learning than the less able. With this guideline, we can manage our teaching learning alternatives. Students' motivation is another very important factor in learning. It is an energy that pushes or pulls the learner towards comma from engagement. As a teacher therefore it is very important to maximize our students' motivation through different mechanisms. You may use reinforce reward mechanisms, and sometimes punishment which doesn't include corporal punishment of course. Then teaching learning practices particularly the active ones are taking in a good position. The other very important point to raise students' motivation is through showing the value of the subject chemistry in general and that specific lesson in particular for themselves as well as for the society at large. Students' participation refers the active involvements of students to the teaching learning processes. It is the direct consequence comma result of students' motivation. In order to maximize participation therefore first we have to work to ensure motivation. Otherwise, even the kind of participation which demonstrates might be superficial and shallow which has minimal impact on students' depth learning. It is natural, if students are better motivated, and then better encouraged to participate. The teacher advises constructive and innovative learning. 3. Human and material resources. As it is true in any practices of actions, teaching learning also affects with the nature and availability of resources that we have. Teachers, assistants, laboratory equipments, 
chemicals and other teaching materials are critically important to run the teaching practices in a fruitful manner. If there are satisfactory or plenty of resources in the teaching learning processes, better to utilize active comma inductive teaching alternatives. If not, it becomes a must to use dictations and demonstrations. In summary, teaching is a process that requires continual decision-making about the kind of behaviors to be attained, the content to be taught, the approaches, methods and techniques to be employed, resources required and the assessment methods to be exercised, etc. Consequently, it demands effective and well-thought planning ahead to ensure the success of the various decisions made throughout the endeavor. Section 2. Implications of some variables in teaching chemistry. Activity 3.2. Discuss the unique features of chemistry contents in relation to the variables mentioned above. Please make the discussion in small group and then to the whole class for 10 minutes. We have tried to mention some common variables that have influences to teaching and of course bind relating to chemistry in the above subtopic. Here the material will attempt to see the fundamental nature of chemistry content and its delivery patterns. If we take chemistry learning to involve the presentation of chemistry knowledge in a learning environment, the perception of the presented knowledge, the processing of the knowledge and the representation of the knowledge, we will begin to appreciate the relationship and interaction of the different theories. The nature of school chemistry, the aim of any school chemistry curriculum is not only to educate in chemistry, but also to educate through chemistry. The aim has to be to generate a population that is informed about chemistry and its importance in modern day society, a population who are positively disposed to chemistry and its impact on society. The longer term impact of this on social trends and attitudes cannot be underestimated while from such an educated population, there will be those who choose to pursue the chemical sciences beyond school and who will become the leaders in the field for the future. What is being advocated is a paradigm shift in our thinking as we seek to design syllabuses and to plan the individual learning experiences for students in chemistry. The same principles will apply at all levels but the choice of applications and the depth of treatment will vary widely. Essentially, the chemistry curriculum can be constructed by exploring three themes. 1. What are the questions that chemistry asks? 2. How does chemistry obtain its answers? 3. How does this chemistry relate to life? Such an approach will meet the needs of the whole population, but will provide the essential critical basis for those who will pursue the study of the chemical sciences beyond school. For example, teaching organic chemistry at the introductory level has made it obvious to the teachers that understanding stereochemistry can be difficult and sometimes traumatic for students. Stereochemistry, one of the major topics in organic chemistry, is frequently a source of confusion when students are first exposed to it and unfortunately, this feeling may happen even after repeated exposure. Visualizing the three-dimensional aspects of molecules and their relationships to other molecules is difficult. When dealing with principles that are particularly difficult to visualize or conceptualize, such as stereochemistry, 
teaching aids and other memory aid devices have been invaluable in the learning process. Realizing that all teaching aids and devices cannot be presented by the instructor in the lecture, these methods can be passed on most efficiently through teaching assistants and tutors due to the one-on-one -on -one nature of student contact time. Often these devices help individual students make a connection between the new material and their own experiences and prior knowledge base. For that reason, a variety of methods have been established that cater to the respective nature of contents and to the respective strengths of each individual. Laboratory Work in Chemistry Assignment 3.2 while laboratory is critically important in chemistry, please do this task as an individual written assignment. The report should not exceed more than two pages. The literature is clear on the importance of practical work in chemistry. A number of issues are of particular interest. These include questions of logistics, goals, procedures, and assessment. Teachers often distinguish practical from theory. The practices are seen as appendages to theory and goals set accordingly. These goals relate to the view that laboratory work is supposed to consolidate conceptual understanding taught in the theory lessons. This ought not to be so. Laboratory work should not be conceived as a handmaid of theory lessons, but as a partner in the development of concepts and understanding. It has been demonstrated that part of the reason lab work is not successful is because of this conception. Conceived in this way, the teachers prepare elaborate laboratory manuals aimed at guiding the students from one step to another until the final result is obtained, concretizing what is learnt in the theory class. On the other hand, the laboratory should be used for problem-solving and development of concepts. This will lead to a revision in the way lab work is conducted. Manuals will be seen not as procedural guides, but as guides to conceptual development. There is clear evidence of the power and effectiveness of laboratory experiences in offering opportunities for genuine problem solving. In designing a lab work experience for any curriculum it is essential to specify the purpose of that lab work. The organization of lab work is therefore dependent on the goal set out for each session. Assignment 3.3 Take sample manuals of laboratory courses in chemistry and examine them in line with the four types of laboratory styles expository, inquiry, discovery and problem-based by preparing clear standards for the evaluation give explanations about the results of your examination. Take this task as a group assignment and report with 4-5 pages. Laboratory works in chemistry has at least four laboratory styles which can be distinguished with three descriptors the nature of the outcomes, approach and procedures. A. The outcome for expository style of learning, comma, experimenting, is somehow predetermined. The procedures of learning also have given or directed by the instructor, and with deductive approach. B. The outcomes of inquiry learning or experimenting is undetermined before the action starts. The procedures are left for students' creativity and autonomy, so that they are going to use inductive approaches. C. Discovery learning is a matter of trying to search predetermined truths knowledge through inductive analysis, and the procedures are given by the course instructor. D. 
problem-based investigation tries to search some predetermined knowledge or skill. Deductive analysis is invested. The procedure is completely determined by students' creativity. As can be seen from the description of the laboratory styles, the effectiveness and appropriateness of each style is dependent on the goal set out for the activity. Again the use of each style is also influenced by the stage of education. For the purposes of further emphasis, whatever the style, lab work should not be seen as a means of concretizing conceptual learning, but as a means of developing conceptual learning. The other purposes of lab work will vary according to level. The purpose of school lab work cannot place high emphasis on practical skills of chemistry, in that these are almost completely irrelevant to the majority of learners in terms of their future studies and careers. At university level, a significant proportion, although not a majority will need experiences some specific skills. However, for most graduates employed as bench chemists after graduation, the specific skills are often very limited and can be developed as needed. It may well be thinking skills, confidence, the grasp of how experimentation can be used, an understanding of how data can be interpreted which are much more important in both the short run and the long run. There are excellent reviews of the purposes of lab work. There is clear evidence in the literature that labs can be modified easily to generate better outcomes. Moreover, the place of lab work is not really contested. However, its purpose is often unclear and poorly specified. The aims cannot be centered on the development of practical skills for these are irrelevant for the majority at school level, nor should lab work be used to confirm theory. Lab work in the curriculum should be devised to develop outcomes relating to the learning of chemistry to make chemistry real, tangible, related to actual materials and their behavior, to illustrate ideas and concepts, to expose theoretical ideas to empirical testing. Practical outcomes, most specific skills are irrelevant but more generic skills are important careful observation, safe experimentation, being accurate where appropriate. Scientific outcomes, skills of deduction and interpretation, an opportunity to see the place of the empirical as a source of evidence in inquiry, opportunities to devise experimental approaches which can offer genuine insights into chemical phenomena. General outcomes, team working, presenting data, discussing, time management, developing ways to solve problems, attitudes towards chemistry, activity 3.6, define attitude in your own words and explain its relation with learning. The personality of the learner normally builds from three basic entities knowledge, attitude, and skill. Attitude towards something negative or positive has a lot to maximize the capacities of the other entities. It most of the time improves by showing the value of chemistry in general and specific chemistry lessons in particular, so that students' motivation will be arisen to maximize their knowledge and skill in that topic. Attitudes are often presented as important in curriculum specifications, and instructional designing however largely ignored in both curriculum construction and instructional techniques. It is well established that a curriculum which is applications-led, rather than designed by the logic of the discipline generates very positive attitudes towards a subject. 
The nature of applications led needs careful exploration in the to curriculum. Whether chemistry is contextualized or illustrated is not necessarily the same in its impact. In an applications-led approach, students are introduced to the chemistry that is needed to make sense of the world around as they know it, giving insights into the perspectives and methods of chemical inquiry as well as its outcomes. The key point is that the actual chemistry to be taught is determined by the applications considered. Social attitudes relating to chemistry, for instance, give emphasis towards the application than the theoretical frames. The approach is to realize such kinds of expectation then have been well established by means of mental interactivity. Teaching units need to be built into the curriculum with the same in mind. The presentation order, for example, can be inverted from atoms, then molecules, then structures, then properties, then reactions, then explanations, then applications to applications, then explanation, then reactions, then properties then structures, then molecules, then atoms. This implies that attitude puts its own effect on the style of teaching and learning and task arrangements. Unit Summary It is self-evident that language demands must be kept at an appropriate level. Language interpretation makes demands on working memory and the density of language must allow for this. Specific care must be taken in the use of non-technical language in chemistry in ways specific to chemistry. Thus words like volatile, feasibility, density, equation, equilibrium have meanings in ordinary use which may be incompatible with their precise use in chemistry situations. Pupils will come to the chemistry class with preconceived ideas. These may be derived from daily life, media or previous teaching. Many of these have been pinpointed. It is essential that curriculum construction takes these into account and allows time and appropriate opportunity for these to be explored so that in a natural way as far as possible such misconceptions and alternative conceptions are modified and altered. Most of chemistry places too much emphasis on algorithmic problems. Nonetheless, these have their place in offering learner confidence in routine procedures and providing techniques and approaches which work. More open-ended problems especially group-based have been shown to be highly effective in developing attitudes, generating enjoyment and addressing issues, where chemistry can be applied in real-life situations. The curriculum must offer opportunities for such experiences. It has to be recognized that problem-solving skills are highly context-dependent. Therefore, problem-solving cannot be essentially a generic skill, and presented as a curriculum aim in this way. In short, the nature of contents in chemistry including the laboratory practices, as it is explained above have their own features that demand to utilize variety of teaching alternatives expository, discovery, inquiry, problem-solving either through deductive or inductive approaches to teaching and learning practices. The kinds of approaches, teaching alternatives and procedures which is given by the teacher, or the curriculum and or left for students independent creativity normally determined from the nature of the outcomes that the curriculum and the teacher plan to achieve. Assessment Mechanisms 1. 
how the nature of chemistry as a subject affects the teaching and learning of chemistry. In your discussion, consider the thought levels of chemistry. 2. Students' attitude is in general weak towards practical or laboratory courses. Do you agree? Why? Evidence-based individual written report.